turn now. We are looking back to interview number two. Uh, if you're just joining us, again, this is Giving Tuesday Live at the Boyce Thompson Institute. We did this last year, so it's officially a tradition now, I think. <laughs> We've done two years in a row. It must be a tradition. Uh, I am joined by uh, an esteemed colleague, Michelle Hett, from the Heck Lab. And uh, Michelle is a faculty member here at BTI, but is, uh, also does uh, most of her work sponsored by the USDA as well. So Michelle, thank you for joining us. And uh, why don't we just do a little bit of an elevator pitch about your, your lab and your research. Sure. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our lab focuses on understanding how insects transmit plant pathogens. So as Dan was saying earlier, plants become the disease just like uh, animals do. And um, similar to how mosquitoes can spread a variety of different pathogens that cause disease in animals, ticks, mosquitoes, and so on, insects that feed on and infect plants can spread bugs around that make so our, our lab is focused on understanding those interactions and trying to develop new strategies to block the spread of, of what we call vector-borne um, plant diseases. So tell us a little bit about, you do a lot of precision screening diseases. So for people out there that, you know, you love your, your orange juice and your citrus and your fruit salads and everything like that, uh, citrus screening has an effect of impact, or already has impacted much of that. So tell us a little bit about that.
my attention is that this is not something that's really, you know, necessarily killing, uh, you know, large scale uh, corporate farms. There's a lot of small farms. Yeah, a lot of family owned farms are certainly large growers as well that are, you know, the disease doesn't spare anyone, anyone grower. All varieties of citrus are susceptible. Um, all species of citrus are susceptible. So it's, um, um, and, and the disease is deadly. So there is no cure. Um, it's very, very hard to diagnose a tree that's affected before it's too late, before it already has severe symptoms and food drops. Um, and, you know, the last hurricane season that just came through the state of Florida really, you know, made matters much worse for those growers because all the trees that were already diseased then just had all the fruit, you know, ripped off. And um, so it's been, uh, it's been a hard year for our citrus growers. So it's just, I mean, we're talking a lot about uh, Florida, and uh, Michelle mentioned that citrus green were now seeded in Texas and California. Is this an international issue as well? And you yeah. have collaborations where you're working internationally on these? Um, well, yes, it, is, it does impact other countries. It's found in all the major citrus growing regions in the world. Brazil has been dealing with this now for many years. As I said, it originated in China over 200 years ago. Um, and so each country, you know, their industries grow citrus a little differently, and so they have different management strategies than as um, compared to the U.S. But there is certainly a lot of information sharing that goes on. Every two years, there's an international meeting that can be in scientists from all over the world to discuss the strategies that are being pursued, to share the latest research, the fostering collaborations. Um, you know, we have several projects that are ongoing um, where we have um, growers from Brazil and other countries that are involved in the advisory board of these projects. So you know, we, we really try to um, talk to as many people as we can who have been impacted by this that can help give us information to help us develop the best strategies in the story. So what would you, uh, how did you get into all of this work? You know, what is your, what was your background and how did you decide to, that this was going to be kind of your focus? Um, you know, what was your journey here to BTI? And so, so what's the Michelle Tech story in that regard? Well, I did my undergraduate degree at Boston University. Um, I was originally a music major. Just a little bit of a deviation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of scientists have musicians also. Yeah. So those passions really go hand in hand. And um, I decided about halfway through my tenure at BU that I wanted to study science. And so I switched to the biology major, and I graduated um, with my BA in biology from Boston University. I then went on to do my PhD at Colton Harbor Laboratory, where I worked in the lab with David Jackson. And he studies um, plant genetics and crop improvement, primarily using maize. Um, and I was one of the first people in his lab that began work on a model crop, on a model plant system called the Rapidopsis. It's a little weed, um, but it's easy to grow, and it's really easy for scientists to use in the lab, so we can do and learn a lot of things about how plants function with the Rapidopsis. And so um, my work focused on understanding how plant cells communicate with one another. And um, that is, is really critically important because pathogens, viruses, and bacteria, they use those communication channels in plants that already exist to move throughout the plant. And so I first became interested in understanding sort of that interaction while I was a graduate student. And then I came to Cornell and I did a postdoc with uh, Stuart Gray, who's a vector biologist. And so um, my focus shifted on from understanding the pathogen interaction with the plant understanding how pathogens interact with their insect vectors that spread them. And I had the opportunity to get an independent position with the USDA, as you mentioned, back in 2013. And the USDA here on campus has a really close relationship with the Boyd Thompson Institute. And I was able to open my lab here at UCI, and it's been a wonderful lab. And I I 
Yeah, yeah, I know some of your lab members will actually go and meet with uh, growers in different regions. They seem to really enjoy that. Yes, know, we so. do. We meet with growers on a regular basis. It's really an important part of what we do. Um, we want to make a sense. We want to tell them about the way they can share that community. Um, they all the time have really important information about the state of the community, um, you know, how the tools are being developed for the point in the field. And so um, our relationship with growers is very important at multiple levels. We like to keep them engaged and informed. That's really been an important part of our research program. We go out to California a couple times a year, Florida, um, and, and even other places. We keep them, you know, with less. We were in Washington, D.C., actually working on a new project to combat the Well, I'm going to use that as a segue because I want you to brag about your Certainly, uh, you know, it's incredibly crucial research, and you know, we're all really proud of it here at BPI. So I'll ask you the same question I asked you, okay. and for <coughs> individuals out there who may not be able to help you in the lab, how else can people help uh, support your research or help what's happening in Florida or some of these effective regions? Sure, that's a really good question. I mean, I think Dan covered earlier the importance of um, support for public funding for science, um, but I would like to take a moment to tell you how important it is um, to provide your kids with a good education and background in science and math, because they're going to grow up to be the next generation of voters and um, and also scientists, and so we really need new young minds coming into the field that can work and have the, the critical thinking skills to solve these major problems. So how you can get involved is to encourage your kids so if you don't have kids, encourage the kids and your family members or your friends to get involved and have opportunities and sit with them and help them with their homework and help them tackle their problems and encourage them and, and not limit them. You know, um, support them to be creative and to pursue their uh, their interests. Well, I think that's some sound advice as a father of three. I'm certainly going to take it to heart. Uh, I. I was not necessarily the strongest in math and science. I was uh, uh, English and social studies, but. Uh, no, but that's okay. <laughs> we all have our strengths. Right. But I think, you know, acknowledging that it wasn't a strength is a great first step. And that's why we have to make sure that we encourage our kids to pursue their interests
like to talk. All right. All right, we'll be right back in a few minutes with uh, Paul Gaffey. He's in the green room. Uh, he's a book column right now. Uh, he's going to be ready to come on and talk about tax transfer. Yeah, I put that in the book column.